I'm proud to call him my friend, one of the most humble, open, honest people you're ever likely to encounter. Ladies and gentlemen, Luis Eduardo Luna. Yeah. Hello. Okay. What a pleasure to be here in Tallinn. Again, I have come many times, and congratulations, Alan Tamin and his team, because this is absolutely extraordinary what he has done. <clears throat> And I'm also very happy to be here with my friends, with Dennis, with Jeremy, with Susan, and other friends sitting in the audience. So a great privilege and honor for me to be here. I begin in a very special year, 1492. 1492 changes, changed everything. It, it makes the beginning of a process that will bring peripheral Europe and Asian Peninsula which center was in the, until the 14th century in the Middle East. It was a turning point in a calamitous way because we had two great civilizatory experiments on both sides of the Atlantic and they came together and one engulfed the other. The two continents had been separated for 12,000 years the, bio, the flora and fauna had been separated. And we had two old worlds. Very often you say the new world, the old world, the new world. No, we have to think that there were two old worlds coexisting and developing. If we think of the year 2600 BC, we have Saqqara in Egypt. But at the same time, we have Karal in Peru. Remember once Graham Hancock told me, please give me that slide, you know, because I'm going to put it in a lecture uh, on Egypt, and nobody will notice the difference. We had in summer, in the southern Mesopotamia, along between the Tigris and Euphrates, we had a civilization who was the foundation of our civilization here. But in Chico Norte, in Peru, at the same time, we have over 30 centers, a very special 1,300 years of great civilization, and where the archaeologists were digging, they could not find any weapons. They could not find walls. They found flutes, they found a cotton, a they found some sacred plants. So it was a completely different civilization. But here in Europe, also you have something similar. The Neolithic cultures, like in the research done by Maria Gimbutas, Lithuanian, your neighbor, who did extraordinary research and it was given hope because also before the, the Indo-European civilization, there was peace here in Europe. There was dance, there was art. Now go back to the 1492, or just before 19, uh, 1492. We have Henry of Portugal open the routes to find commerce and to expand Christianity. He was the beloved son and true soldier of Christ, according to the Pope, Nicholas V. Remember, the Pope was thought at the time to be the king of the universe. He gave permission to the, to the king to full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, and subjugate the Saracens and pagans and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they may be. What happened in 1492? We had, on one side, we have the conquest of Granada by the Christians. There was the last bastion of Arabic uh, culture in Spain. We have the expulsion of the Jews the same year. And then we have the discovery 
of America. Look at this painting, you know, the attitude is really incredible how it was depicted, the situation. The Pope Alexander VI then divided the world between the two great kingdoms, Portugal and Spain, just a line. They didn't know any, anything about the, 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 the shape of the continent, but anyway, it was divided. This side for Spain, that side for Portugal. Easy, you know, it's the whole world. And another document that was uh, uh, written for the Spaniards is they, they used to go to, to the tribes with this document. They read it very solemnly. The people, you know, the Indians didn't understand the word. And they say you have to completely submit to the Pope, who is the king of the universe, and, 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 the, and the king, who is now your master. And if you do not do this, and maliciously make delay in it, I certify to you that with the help of God, we should powerful enter into your country and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the joke and obedience of the church and of their highness. The deaths and losses which shall accrue from this are your fault and not that of, of their highness or ours not of these cavaliers who come with us. And, and if you are not sure about this, you can, uh, you can see the document. It's here, you know, the Indians. <laughs> so, 1521, the conquest of Tenochtitlan by Hernán Cortés. The Spaniards gradually take everything. The goods were coming to Sevilla, going to Europe, Spain became very wealthy. We have the Colombian exchange in which goods were coming from the Americas, and then at the same time, the animals, diseases were coming to the Americas, and we have something which can be really uh, be examined geologically, because suddenly we have this huge exchange of organisms. We know what happened the globalization, the slave trade, the suppression, and we had Pangea was divided it's upon millions of years ago. The organisms, the living, the biological were divided, but now suddenly we have a new Pangea through the connections, a, a process that goes until today, of course. So what happened with the Amerindians? The Spaniards first arrived to Española, which is now Santo Domingo and IT, and by a conservative estimate, there was over 100,000 people on the island of Española in 1492. Only 16,000 survived a generation later. And this happened again and again all over the Americas, to the point that 95 to 98 percent of the population of the Americas everywhere die out. We have here a, a, a chart from the Valley of Mexico. We had 26, almost 26 million people in 1518, down to 700,000 in 1623. The Amerindians, they, according to Jean de Lery, he said they are stronger more robust and well filled out, more nimble and less subject to disease. They age as if they daily drank from the fountain of youth. And in fact, archaeological evidence shows the skeletal remains from that time until the 20th century, the healthiest human specimens of the Western Hemisphere. The Amerindians have huge knowledge about the flora and the fauna. They knew how to use many different ecosystems. They domesticated countless uh, uh, plants. The varieties, the thousands of varieties of corn, or potatoes, uh, uh, manioc, uh, tomatoes, chile, etc. Only three animals were domesticated in the Americas, the llamas, the cuy, and the, and the turkey. This one is uh, our turkey, still alive. His name is Fernando. <clears throat> and all these, you know, grains, fruits, legumes, nuts, roots, and tubers 
can you imagine, three-fifths of the food that we consume today came from the Americas. But we have the Inquisition, we have the Inquisition in Spain. This is in, in Madrid, in the Plaza Mayor in Madrid. It was really a ritual. When the Spaniards went to Mexico and they were complaining about the, the Aztecs were having human sacrifices, the Spaniards have, have, were having human sacrifices. The Inquisition is that, very solemnly, ritual, ritualized. And they continue doing this on the other side of the Atlantic. Per, the persecution, destruction of the libraries of the Mesoamericans. Here is Diego de Landa, who, who's, who wrote, we found a large number of books in these characters, and as they contain nothing in which were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil, we burn them all. The same happened, so we have only four, I think, books left. The same happened with the Kipos. In, in, in a decree, 1583, he said, and because of Leo books the Indians have used and some continue to use registers made of different threads that they call Kipos, and with this they preserve the memory of their old superstitions, rites, ceremonies, and perverse customs. The bishops should diligently try to take away from the Indians completely all the records or kippus that facilitate their superstition. And this was systematically. All the sacred plants were banned in 1620. Peyote was declared diabolic. If ingested, the person was accused of witchcraft, a crime comparable to cannibalism, and could be executed. Even though uh, peyote was used for thousands of years in, the, in, in Mesoamerica. Brugmansias as well. We have here a document from 1661 uh, that Brugmansia, Floripondio, used for divination with diabolic intent. It is called borrachera, Floripondio, or campana, bell, given that the flower looks like one. They use them to cure persistent illness. Either they get healthy or die with it. It is also used to become maestros, teachers, and learn the art of witchcraft. And this was completely you know, systematic. But the same thing had happened before here in Europe. That was the, the expansion of Christianity meant the, the persecution of the pagan world. And the pagan world was natural religions. So in Germany, St. Bonifacius got the sacred a tree of Thor, and here in Estonia, the same thing happened. German missionaries hacking the sacred groves of the Estonians in 2020. So, what happened in the America was a continuation of the process that had started already here, the persecution against animism. Remember, the Lithuanians, the Estonians, they worshipped the sun and the moon and the winds and the water and the rivers and so on. The use of sacred plants was very ancient in the Americas, in the case of peyote, here in the case of uh, San Pedro cactus, in the Chabin culture, 1200 to 300 BC, we have representations of the, uh, of the cactus in the, in the um, context of shamanic transformation. I will come at some point to this uh, idea. And just two years ago, they found in a, in a ritual space a, a, a San Pedro cactus, showing that the use of um, the, the ritual use of San Pedro was at least 4,000 years. In Tiwanaco, around the Titicaca Lake, you probably have seen, you know, uh, the, the ruins. It was an extraordinary culture, very advanced. I would say even more advanced in, in, in terms of engineering than the Incas. Um, they had these strange uh, sculptures. This, this, this one is the, called the Ponce Stella, and this figure has something there, and the archaeologists didn't know what it was, and it was some object, some ritual object. But thanks to um, work done here in San Pedro de Tecama in northern Chile, which is one of the driest places on Earth, Archaeologists were able to recover mummies and rehydrate them, gradually taking out the, the textiles and found in 25% of the male mummies bags with a paraphernalia to snuff uh, Anadelantera colubrina. This is the tree, this is in our garden in, in, Flor in Florianopolis, southern Brazil. 
beautiful tree. So they found this, and now the thing is clear. This, uh, these are the implements, these are the paraphernalia for the use of an Adenanthera colubrina. So this is a completely different technology. So the archaeology didn't know what it was. Now we know that they are traveling into the universe through these uh, uh, plants. And like nobody, you know, if the, our world, you know, completely disappears, the only thing that's left is something like that, you know, with this little thing, we'll, you know, they will never imagine that with this little thing we were able to communicate with uh, everyone. So we have many examples of uh, 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 iconography showing without any doubt that there were sacred plants used, in this case, Anadenanthera and the Mochi culture, uh, also coca um, in San Agustin in Colombia, and etc. If you want to read about Anadenanthera, this is the Bible. This is written by Constantino Manuel Torres, my very good friend, together with uh, uh, David Reike, who is a chemist. And they were able to even to find uh, traces of bufotenin in the, in, in the, in the bags where they were um, keeping uh, the, the seeds and the ashes, mixed with ashes. And in Colombia, plenty of uh, uh, evidence of the use of mushrooms in the gold work of Colombia. This was done by Rachel Domatov in Mexico. We have the evidence of the sacred flowers used by the Aztecs and so on. So, now in the, in the Americas, there was the use of, of, let's put it, psychedelics, you know, but all these, you know, let's say sacred plants, it was prevalent. It's impossible to understand Amerindian culture without reference to these plants. In the old world, they were also, you had also plants, belladonna, henbane, cannabis, uh, you know, Amarita muscaria here, Martian, different kinds. But you undergo, underwent uh, inqui the Inquisition, which was the persecution, systematic persecution of the people who knew about these things. And here in Europe, it was mostly female shamanism. And the witches were burned because of the knowledge of these plants. In the Americas, when Columbus arrived on the second voyage, he saw the Indians using two things, tobacco and they using, you know, and cojoba. And uh, Columbus told uh, uh, the friar, Pané, to write about what they are doing. He, Pané uh, learned the language. He was there long enough. And the first book written in European language in the Americas was a book about the sacred plant, Anadenanthera. So now we go to the Amazon. And for a moment, many of you, including myself, because I was even born in the Amazon, but I was also learned, you know, that we were happy, you know, that the Europeans arrived, otherwise we were running out naked. And when I went to Bogota, I was, uh, I was discriminated because I was uh, the Indian, I was coming from the Amazon. But the Amazon, as Jeremy was saying yesterday in the, in the um, uh, press conference, is a forest that has been here before the dino dinosaurs. And, uh, you know, it's a very ancient forest. And there have been civilizations in the Amazon, completely different structure, like sort of satellites, two, three people, covering hundreds of square meters. Uh, so there have been advanced civilizations. They have the best soils in the world. They are uh, in the uh, done by the Amerindians. Uh, the, um, the Amerindians, when they are out, it was the only civilization that left the place in better condition. The Sumerians, the Greeks, the Romans, everyone, you know, moving and devastating the earth. Uh, the Amazonians, the opposite. And we have plenty of evidence of extraordinary, extraordinary ceramics and so on, showing that the Amazon really was populated perhaps by 10, 15 million people, highly evolved, and with extraordinary knowledge of plants. The Amazon is, is also not only biological diverse, but also cultural diverse. It's one of the places still today with a higher number of languages, even though it's mostly flat, but still the people differentiate. I don't, we don't know for what mechanism. So this is the place where Yahé and Ayahuasca uh, was born within this context of great uh, uh, advanced civilization. Yajé, which is used here in Colombia, Ecuador, is the combination of Banisteropsis capi and, um, sorry, and the Diplopterus cabrerana, another vine of the same family. And ayahuasca is the combination of Banisteropsis capi and Cicotre viridis from the uh, coffee family, the Rubiaceae. 
Okay, we know the diplopteros, both diplopteros and cicotrevididis contain dimethyltryptamine. That makes the two uh, portions similar. And in, in Berenstelosib, we have three alkaloids, harmine, tetrahydroharmine, and harmaline. I will not talk about this. Just only want to point out that a recent uh, study of one ayahuasca brew found one, 108, uh, 124 different uh, compounds in those marked in blue as, uh, has medicinal value. We know that they have some uh, medicinal value. And none of the compounds has any noxious effect, you know, so it's pure medicine. And uh, in Asia, especially in China and in Japan, they have been doing a lot of work on harmine. Very surprised. I don't know if it is because of ayahuasca or simply, you know, chemists found, were studying the, the, the properties of harmine. And harmine is antimicrobial, antifungal, antitumoral, cytotoxic, antioxidant, increases insulin sensitivity, prevents bone loss, and is the only molecule within 100,000 uh, examined that stimulates the uh, production of pancreatic cells, beta cells. In a study, in a, in a uh, Dale Millar in this book that you are going to see here, uh, he put together the uh, kind of companion of the, what we know about harmine, and it is so extraordinary that Edefre uh, ah, the other thing I forgot, Jordi Riva found that harmine and tetrahydroharmine stimulates also the production of neurons, so it's neurogenesis. So we have to think of ayahuasca as, first of all, as a medicine. Edefrexia had the idea, and he's now working on this, of testing the activation of Banisteropsis capi, because perhaps what it is activating is stem cells. So you take the ayahuasca, and somehow, you know, the, the, it finds whatever the problem, I don't say all the problems, but there is a possibility that many of the effects of ayahuasca are just because of that. It will go there and generate the stem cells for this. Okay, ayahuasca, as it is not known, apparently came from the north, from the Valpes region, and gradually has been incorporated by many other indigenous tribes, including today. Uh, not far from where I live, there are Guarani Indians, and they have recently also uh, 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 adopted ayahuasca as part in, in the ritual. So the globalization of ayahuasca is not only international, but also within the Amazon. And when I, Stephen White and I, we put together the ayahuasca reader, there are a few copies here, we found, um, we have text uh, translated from 12 di different languages into English, and with reference to many of the indigenous tribes in the upper Amazon, and just show you that these are the names of the tribes. When I did my doctoral dissertation, I found 72 different indigenous groups using ayahuasca or yaje or, or, or other kinds of combinations. The pioneer was Rafael Karsten, very close to us, you know, in Finland. He was a Swedish uh, Finnish scholar who uh, was the very first one to do work with, uh, na about NATEM in Ecuador in the 20s. I, I'm born in Colombia, went to Bogota, was sent to, Sp uh, went to Spain, then I lived seven years in Norway, and I got a job in Finland, and it happens that I got the job that Rafael Skarsten was having in the 30s, you know. So I was having his chair for uh, many years. And he, uh, he was the one who first um, 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 made a description of the ceremonies, and they were collective ceremonies. They were not these small shamanic in the dark. They were collective ceremonies in which many women were participating. Okay, now my own story. You know, I was born in, <laughs> in Florencia. This is Flor oh, sorry, uh, go back. Uh -oh. uh, so this is my town in the eastern slopes of the Andes. This is my town when I was already 12 years old. When I, uh, when I was little, there was no running water, nothing, uh, no electricity. And it became people from other areas of Colombia, and it became more and more busy, cars, and the deforestation. So. I cannot say any longer that I'm Amazonian. I belong to a, you know, grass plain, you know, where, where full of cows, and it's still until today one of the places for most deforestation, you know. So we have been transforming 
this extraordinary forest into hamburgers, basically. So I was, had a religious education, I was going to be a priest, I was sent to Spain, I lived for six months in this monastery, and then two years in another one, and then I left the seminar, not because of Terence, no? and, and then I started to study in, the, in Madrid. In 71, after seven years away, I went for holidays, this is Florencia, and I have met since I was a, ch a, a child a, an Indian who was living in Yurayaco, coming f originally from this region in Mocoa. Um, Terence appeared in Florencia. Uh, uh, Terence was uh, just nine months or eight months older than me. And then with Yahé that we got from Apollinar, although he didn't, he was not in the ceremony, we just took the Yahé. The Yahé that was mediated, this is Dennis there, uh, uh, med uh, the, Terence was at the time writing The Invisible Landscape. I was even helping to uh, quantify the, 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 the changes in the, in the, uh, in the I Ching. And, uh, and recently I contacted, uh, we got the, the brew from France, uh, from Hans, who was a German who had the best restaurant in town who had a friend, a Hungarian, who knew Apollinar, and it is through these gringos that I took for the first time in my life, Yahé. Okay, that changed for me everything. 71. 73, I went to see Terence in, in, in Berkeley. All these books came out. I started to educate myself about this. Then I changed my career in a way. I started to study science. And seven years later, in 1979, I went back to Florencia. I traveled through uh, South America and then came to see Apollinar again and asking, please, Don Apollinar, I have been waiting this moment for seven years. He started to love. He said, oh, you can wait some more months. You know, I said, no, no, it has to be today. I didn't have any more money, so I, it had to be. And then finally, after you know, imploring, uh, I took the motions before that because I thought that he was not going to give us yahe. So my, I was with my brother, we took the motions, and, uh, and, uh, and then it, again, the, the thought, you know, yahe, yahe. So we went to uh, Don Apollinar, and finally he said yes. So we took the yahe, I was inside the house, and uh, waiting for the effects. Suddenly I started to look through the roof, and I was looking at the stars through the roof, and then I became very afraid, and, and, and then I became a serpent, and so on. Okay, so next morning, the, my brother took this photograph, and I asked Don Apollinar, why do you take Yahé? He said, to see all those animals out there, so you could see what is out there inside. I wanted to make a film about him. He died a few months later. Then I went to Iquitos. Terence told me, go to Iquitos. There is an ayahuasca tradition. I started to work with different ayahuasqueros. Made a film that you can see in YouTube. Don Emilio and his little doctors. Somebody put it there. I, I, don't, I don't complain. The, the subtitles are not very good. And anyway, so I spent time there learning about the whole process of illness, health and illness. And um, uh, Sometimes, in this case, Don Jose Coral was uh, uh, curing another shaman, and so on. And he was the one, Don, Don Emilio was the one who told me, ayahuasca is a teacher. In Spanish, he said, ayahuasca es un doctor. It's a, you know, it's a doctor. Y hay otros doctores, and there are many other doctores. So I, I discovered the concept of plant teachers, and also the idea that ayahuasca is, uh, you can put other things there, and the changes, um, so they say that the spirit of this other plant will reveal and, and, and say what are their medicinal properties. Remember that the proper context here is not the visionary so much, it is the medicinal. I wrote my doctoral dissertation about, about this tradition, uh, defended in Stockholm, it was published beautifully in, in Czechish. And then I did field work in other areas. I was in the Sibundoy Valley, uh, um, working with the, the Kamsa, uh, that use Brugmansia, the borrachero, the, the uh, plant, the scopolamine uh, atropine alkaloids containing plant, but they also use uh, Ayawa Yahe, which was bought from Indians lowland, in the lowland. I did a study about the garden of, this, uh, of these shamans, and one of the mestizos was um, 
this in blue, the blue in the blue poncho. He was studying with uh, Miguel Chindoy, and one day he said, you know, yes, I'm studying El Jardín de la Ciencia, the Garden of Science. So again, the same concept that um, Don Emilio said, these are teachers. I found it that in Colombia, the plants are the teachers. This is the mestizo who probably, this is in the 80s, you know, so must be now uh, perhaps uh, practicing shaman. In order to do this, it is not simply taking it. You have to keep a diet. You have to be in isolation. So there is a, a procedure, you know. So it, it's not easy. You know, you have to go into the depths of yourself. And, okay. After working with the indigenous and the mestizo, I thought I want to see what happens in the Brazilian phenomenon. And I studied for some years the Brazilian phenomenon, um, the ayahuasca churches in, in Brazil. And first of all, um, these are intimately linked with the Afro-Brazilian religion because the founders, the creators of these religions, they came from the northeast into the Amazon. It was the, during the Second World War. Brazil took the, play, the side of the Allies. They sent some people to fight Mussolini in Italy, and other people went to the Amazon to recover the rubber trade, which was completely disappeared. And, uh, and because the Japanese have taken Southeast Asia, and so suddenly the Allies needed desperately Robert. That's why Schultes was sent to, uh, to uh, the Colombian Amazon to try to see where there was Robert. <coughs> These people created new religions in Brazil. The first one was Raimundo Ireneo Cerro, Serra in the 30s, then in the 40s, Daniel Pereira de Matos, and then in the 60s, Jose Gabriel da Costa. Uh, Santo Daime that you hear everywhere, it is uh, the work mostly of Sebastián Mota, who was a disciple of uh, Alfredo uh, um, uh, or Irineo Serra and created a new, a new, uh, very similar, but a new, it was a, like a cisc, you know, it was a, a, a separation from the main one. And this is the Santo Daime that you hear about. There are over 30 or 40 countries nowadays. This is, the, this is a, the cover of a book uh, on Santo Daime, an early book. And here is Sebastian Mota giving a drop of ayahuasca to the newborn baby so that he will be intelligent. This is the first church. And I participated in some of the, the rituals, the, the preparations, and so on. The, the music is very important. They say that, that ayahuasca gives them the, the, the music talent. Participated in ceremonies in Mapia, in the spiritual center of of the Daimer religion, met the, uh, the, the leader nowadays, who is uh, uh, Gregorio, who is uh, the son of uh, Sebastian Mota, etc. By the way, this man that you see here, he was 90-something, uh, 19 uh, years old. He was the youngest of five brothers, all alive, <laughs> drinking ayahuasca, of course. And um, uh, Alex Polari, a good friend, who is one of the leaders today. So, also visited the UDV. I, I did some work. I was doing a comparative study of, of UDV and Barquinha. I will show you this later. And the UDV, we, Dennis and I, we were invited to this conference. And uh, very, uh, I have to admire the UDV. There are a lot of lawyers because thanks to them, ayahuasca was um, made, uh, for religious use, was made legal in Brazil. Yes, Dennis. <laughs> collecting plants, and I don't know if you're going to talk about that, but anyway, Jess Callaway, other colleagues or friends, were, do, did the first biomedical study of ayahuasca. I concentrated on Daniel Pereira de Matos. No anthropologist had been working uh, on, on this religion, so for me it was extraordinary, because you had at the same time um, the Afro-Brazilian with the songs, with the, the pontos, the dances, the, the incorporation of spirits, so, so on, and the ayahuasca drink. So I spent several years working on this. Uh, I only published in, in Portuguese, not in English, but anyway, I have to do it some, someday. It's really extraordinary church. Now a little bit about the art, because I want to cover a lot of stuff. Um, the uh, uh, yaje in Capi, uh, uh, ayahuasca, is uh, very important uh, among the Indians because they base the iconography in the, in, in the visions. Also, the narratives, the mythology, it's all embedded into the experiences. 
impossible to understand, I say it once more, understand the minds of uh, Amazonian Indians without reference to this kind of sacred plants. The indigenous artists continue to produ uh, uh, pr produce work based or on uh, the experiences, or inspired by the experience. Raisel Dolmatov, an Austrian, was in Colombia and took paper and pencils to the Indians who did their whatever they wanted, and it was, they were painting their divisions. They complained that the, he, the Rashid had not brought enough yellow colors, because they have a whole range of colors. For them, Yahé is a solar entity, and, and there are many kinds of yellows. I was with the Chibibu as well. They are famous for the iconography, the ceramics, the textiles, and so on. And they uh, say, according to uh, Angelica Gebhardt, that uh, these designs are musical, not that it's a partiture, it's not a one-to-one, -one, but somehow it is, it, it is music. When I was with, a, I don't know if I have a photo here, no, perhaps not, uh, of one of my, my teachers, uh, Don Basilio, at the end of one month to keep in the diet and all that, so he said, I'm going to put a song on you so that when you go from here, you are protected. So he was singing a song, and I said, what is this song? And then he took one of these clothes, he said, I'm putting this on you. So he's covering me with these patterns. And the Shibibo think that this is, uh, you know, is a, is a kind of, um, of um, uh, I don't know how to, uh, feel that is covering you, and they believe that illness is the distortion of the pattern. So they will hum, or they will sing, or bring the spirit of the hummingbird, and the hummingbird with the wings will produce music and will restore the, 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 the patterns. In 85, thanks to Dennis, I met Pablo Maringo uh, in Pucallpa. He was doing, this is, this is a, an advanced one, I don't have here uh, of the first ones, uh, 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 paintings in the cheapest paper, in water, watercolors. And I had the idea to ask him whether he painted, he told me that he had a good memory. He has, in Amazonia, have eidetic memory. They are able to see something, keep the image in their, in their, in their minds, and Pablo was able to just simply project it, you know, no, no copies, you know, just project the images. And so he said, I remember everything I have seen. So I told him, please, can you? And so this is, uh, he, said, he made several, this one I got, uh, which is completely different. I mean, the, the, you know, uh, you, I was used as an anthropologist that the people will talk about the visions, but now to see the visions, it was a completely different thing. I asked him, what is this, what is that? You know, I sent a, took a photocopy and asked questions, and he, I got a huge description. I, I realized that I was, it was a golden mine. You know, during years I collaborated with Pablo. He was doing the, the paintings. I was asking questions. He made a painting to answer to my questions and so on. We co collaborated for years. This is the Amazonian Cosmos, uh, the first oil painting he made, and so on. So here we see the forest through the eyes of somebody who uh, uh, takes ayahuasca uh, through the, the eyes of an animistic person. Everything is alive. Everything is intelligent. You are communicating with nature. So we put together the book Ayahuasca Visions, which, according to Dennis and other researchers, said that it was, in a way, like the, the beginning of the globalization of ayahuasca. I just, this is from the internet, just, and uh, you know, pages and pages and pages. Uh, I learned through Michael Coe, a student from Hawaii, that there are about 150 retreat centers in, in, in Iquitos, you know, offering, many of them owned by Americans. And, and the thing is that the, the plants are being over harvest, sometimes taken by the root, you, you have to harvest the, the, the ayahuasca vine. You never take the roots, but the, the over harvesting, and now it's difficult to find, increasingly difficult to find ayahuasca. These are the negative uh, sides of the tourism. And, but on the, on the side, many of the uh, vegetalistas and are creating their own botanical gardens. So I think that there is a, you know, Many of the Westerns that go with good intentions, learn techniques and, and so on, become interested in the plants. So for, some, for many others, it is just simply, you know, um, spiritual narcissism. Just, oh, I took Yahé, I took San Pedro, I took mushrooms and this and that, <clears throat> and nothing happens. There is no, no consequence to that. With Pablo, we created a little, 
uh, school of painting, which, uh, ah, and this one, this will be interesting for you. This is Anderson de Bernardi, the author of the big painting. Um, he was 18, and now he's doing this kind of extraordinary uh, paintings. This is the school. We had at some point 300 students. And I left in 94, but this continues. And recently, I was invited to an exhibition in Ocala, Florida, where they published this beautiful book based on the paintings of Pablo Maringo and his disciples. And now, it's impossible. I mean, the, the impact of this school and Pablo Maringo has been tremendous in Peru. So you see all these artists. I never met them, but anyway, this is uh, in a way the result of um, that school of painting. Many different artists. And I have been engaged in uh, organizing uh, visionary art exhibitions because art is something that goes straight to your heart. You know, you start to talk drugs and this and that, dangerous. You see beautiful art and, and you know, it, it, it talks to you. And when you say, well, this is the consequence of experiences with these plants, then you think of these plants in a completely different way. We did also in Wasiwaska some experiments with Edefrexa. We were interested in binocular rivalry. What happens? You know, binocular rivalry is when you see the same image, you see you have two percepts, two possibilities, like the Neckar cube. You can see it like that, like that. So with Ede, uh, the, the question was what happens when you take ayahuasca and then made the, the test before and after, and before you have the uh, uh, the normal alternation, but then on the face of ayahuasca, you have one of the percepts very, very prominent, and then you have fusion, which means that rapid alternation of the two percepts. We don't know what this means. We don't know what is some kind of fast communication between the hemisphere. We don't know. This has to be repeated in fMRI to see if, if we get to know much more. In Brazil, they have been doing extraordinary work showing, for instance, how ayahuasca, I mean, here you can see uh, when you have your eyes open, you see a, uh, see. You have a, a strong signal, eyes open, eyes. You imagine, imagine, and then it drops. You know the signal drops. You take ayahuasca with eyes open. You have a strong signal, eyes closed again, another strong sig uh, uh, signal. So you are seeing with the eyes closed. And Edefrexa and Attila Savo in, in Debrecen University doing extraordinary uh, work um, showing the physiological effects of ayahuasca. They find the important function of DNT in the immune system and it's anti inflammatory. And pity I don't have the time to go through more of this. That now, and Thiago uh, Arruda uh, in uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro doing also studies with uh, fMRI and showing how even with a small dose of ayahuasca, you, uh, it is possible to, you, in his experiments, without, without, uh, uh, without ayahuasca, I mean, before that, you put the person in an fMRI, you have to click man or woman, you don't concentrate on the content of the photograph, but they are showing you abhor uh, abhorrent images, which their brain registers, and then, but you only think, concentrate male, female, but then the, the brain uh, captures that, that uh, and you have a strong uh, amygdala reaction. Then under ayahuasca, with a little bit of ayahuasca, no visions there, you have no signal in the amygdala and a strong signal in the insula. I don't know, Dennis, you will have what it will be the significance on that. But anyway, we know the psilocybin, the connections uh, with psilocybin, which is, you know, uh, psilocybin and, uh, and DMT, very closely related molecules. We have tremendous um, um, uh, interconnection with different areas of the, of, of the brain. So there is huge, I mean, this is just a drop, you know, huge research being done uh, today. So now we go to the bad news. So we are in the Anthropocene. We are undergoing right now terrible damage. The Great Barrier Reef, massive death. This was just published uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the Times, you know, probably this big article, but we know the bees are disappearing very fast. I was talking to Nandushka Lee, who is a microbiologist and entomologist, and she was telling me that a report came out 
that in Germany, in the most protected forest areas, the insect biomass has dropped 75%. So our insects are dying out, which means pollination, you know. And uh, last year, we lost 15.8 million hectares of tropical uh, forest. So the equivalent about 40 football fields per minute during the whole year. So we are now down six, you know, it's calculated that at the dawn of agriculture we had six trillion trees. We are now have only half of them and we continue cutting them down. We, of course, we know the human beings had, you know, killed the megafauna in Australia, in the Americas, everywhere. But we are now in increase, you know, what we, it's called the sixth extinction, which is going, the biologists said that we lose about 150 to 200 species per day nowadays. So we are really going into the abyss. Normally we have periods of glacial periods, interglacial periods, 200 uh, parts per million. Uh, now we have, it is rising from 200, in interglacial periods 280, now 370, and last April 410 parts per million. The highest monthly average in recorded history, and according to ICE records, the highest value in at least 800,000 years. It is happening right now, this year. And we experienced, I was in Helsinki this summer, run out of, you know, the, the, you could not find a fan in, 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 the, in the city. Uh, people have no air conditions, uh, air conditioners. So uh, 35 degrees up in northern Finland, fires in Sweden, in Greece, in Portugal, etc. So it is happening now. We cannot hide it. We cannot run away. So reading this book, The Human Planet, how we created the Anthropocene. So the scientists are speculating when this happened. Uh, the, how to define the Anthropocene, because it has to be defined geologically, because it has to be precise strata, so that geologists from the future could say, okay, something happened here. So, and they came to the conclusion 1610, which was a drop in temperature and a drop in carbon dioxide. What happened? Remember, 1492, the Europeans arrived to America, uh, five, 95 to 98 percent of the popul uh, population disappeared. The fields, because the Amerindians mo uh, were mostly horticulturalists, the fields were abandoned, the forest came back, the forest absorbed carbon uh, dioxide, uh, it went down, temperature went down, and from that moment on, 1610, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. we are just, the temperature and the carbon dioxide is just going up and up and up. Uh, the mark uh, was not only the drop in temperature, but also, I told you, the, the ex it, Colombian exchange, so you can find in the strata microorganisms and organisms of all sorts from all over the world. So we have the Pangaea concept. Other people are saying that, okay, we can say that it will be 1950, the year of the great as, uh, acceleration, boom in human population, booming consumption of everything from copper to, to, to corn, and diversification of the things we leave back, you know, the technosphere, so, so that you, the geologists will be able to find, you know, extreme, you know, more and more complexity of things that we do, you know, our electronics and so on. This uh, happened after the, the, you know, the, the World War, and this is another mark, a geological mark, you can see when you have the fir first mark of radioactivity, so it will be possible to trace it. But now, it seems, I, I'm not completely sure about the debate, but I think that 60, 1610, it is really the, the, the mark for the beginning of the uh, Anthropocene. So what we have been experimenting is a gradual loss of knowledge, from uh, hunters to animal husbandry to factory farming, and this is what we have today. So gathering, to agriculture, to this kind of farming, and to this with monocultures and, and, and the insecticides and so on, agro business. From fish, you know, fish, uh, fishery, from fishing to uh, uh, 
traditional methods to this, what we are having today with mass extinction also of, of fish. You know, we are probably we are going to run out of, of most fish, you know, within 20 years or so. And also the social structure changed from egalitarian structure more or less more into pyramidal hierarchical. I, I was just watching a documentary about the one percent and there was, I don't say the name, but it was one of these billionaires who, you know, the, the, the interviewer was asking, do you want more money, more money, more money, billions, more money? I said, yes. One day I will go to the moon and I will look at the earth and I will, see, I will think the earth is in my portfolio. So, what are plantations? Ecological simplifications. Living things that are transformed into resources, into assets. By removing them from their life worlds, plantations are machines of replication, ecologies dedicated to purification and the production of the same, completely the opposite of what is life, which is biodiversity. So look at this, this is Bayer, environmental protection, and you have monoculture. No, this is the idea, this is the, the, the progress. You know? So we have, on the one side, monotheism, against animism, everything is alive, everything intelligent, there is divinity in everything that exists, with monotheism, one separate God who is dictating and the truth is here. And you have the, the people who are the representatives, who are form part of the hierarchy and tell the rest of the people what they have to think. Animism, in fact, is not an idea, it's not, it's not like, let's say, idealism, it's not something philosophical that you have in your mind. Animism implies an intimate knowledge of the natural world, therefore greater understanding of living processes. So it is based on direct reflexive, pre reflective perception, uh, disclosing the things and elements that surround us not as inert objects, but expressive subjects, entities, powers, potencies. So we have to change our attitude from object to subject. And I think, I dare to say that animism is our only way out. If we do not consider everything that exists, you know, as, and Jeremy is going to talk about that, as people, people like us, they are, we are just one organism among 10 million more uh, species of plants and animals, about among 50 million uh, species of uh, fungi, about trillions of species of, of microorganisms, we have to completely change our relationship. Animism, to a great extent, is the recognition that there is mind in life, there is subjectivity. Remember my teacher, Jose Corral, was, we were cooking ayahuasca and then we were looking at the bubbles coming out. He said, you see, these are people. So, in indigenous oral cultures, nature itself is articulate, it speaks. The human voice is an oral, in an oral culture is always, to some extent, participatory with the voices of wolves, wind, and waves. Participant that is with the encompassing discourse of an animated earth. This is, this is uh, Monica Gagliano who, has been, uh, Gagliano, who has been with us just recently in, in Florianopolis, in Huasibasca. She has done extraordinary experiments showing how the plants have memory, make choices, uh, 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 not only um, uh, perceive sounds, emit sounds, and so on. So there is whole revolution, not only Monica, but many other um, uh, scientists, uh, they call themselves evolutionary ecologists, and uh, showing how science really is showing that the plants and the animals, and <laughs> naturally, microbiologists, and the, and the microbes, there is intelligence everywhere. We are living in an intelligent world. Uh, Paul Stamets does the same, you know, says the same about the fungal. The mycelium is an exposed sentient membrane, aware and responsive to changes in, in its environment. Interlacing mycelium membranes form, I believe, a complex neuron-like web that acts as a fungal collective consciousness. He used to say that the, 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 the mycelium formed the internet, you know, the real internet, which is below. So when, and the great uh, pioneer in this, is Jeremy, who in 2005 published this Intelligence in Nature. One of the things he said, in my view, the perspective of science and indigenous knowledge could both be true at the same time and could even be combined to produce a deeper understanding of the living world. 
So we have to completely go away from this, you know. God said, let us make man in our image, you know. And even the Greeks, you know, Protagoras said, man is the measure of all things. Well, even Socrates, in, in one of the, the dialogues, um, Socrates is invited uh, to go for a walk in the outside, uh, in, in the fields. And Socrates said, forgive me, my friend. I'm devoted to learning. Landscapes and trees have nothing to teach me. Only the people in the city can do that. But you, he was having a, a book, I think they have found a potion to charm me into living. For just as people lead hungry animals forward by shaking branches of fruit before them, you can lead me all over Attica or anywhere else you like, simply by waving in front of me the leaves of a book containing speech. So w what we have come to is that, you know, we Western literature, that's the words of David Amram, Western literature, uh, culture, especially philosophy, cut its ties to the sensory world, not any longer the contact, and found itself floating in a self-referential, disembodied world of pure abstraction. So we have to be aware where we are, where we belong in the web of life. We have to also be aware that we are inside of the trillions microorganisms, which are 90% of our cells, which influence our mood. Uh, they are in communication with us, no doubt about that. And when we go to the forest, think that there are not simply trees, there is communication over uh, by a sense, volatiles, communicating with other plants, with the insects, the whole world. And underneath also, there is, through the mycorrhizal, uh, you have the communication between uh, uh, the, the trees, not only of the same species. Uh, they say that the, the, the soil is like a, like a supermarket, and some plants are specialized in getting one nutrient and the other, other nutrients, and they exchange. So there is a lot going, a lot of plant communication going underneath. And just to, like a positive note, um, we have been doing experiments trying to grow ayahuasca together with a fast-growing tree. The first time it didn't work, the second time beautifully, and also the th third time, although this is in poor soils. So suddenly we have the idea that Banisteriopsis capi, the vine, even though, um, I mean, it is legal because harmine, tetrahydrohamine, harmaline, they are legal substances, there is no problem with them, has all these benefits. I think that it will be possible to grow this, uh, and not only this plant, but many others, together with fast-growing trees, and produce a whole industry of Banisteriopsis legally, recovering poor soils, and taking away <laughs> the money from the pharmaceutical companies, because you cannot patent Banisteriopsis, and use it as a real medicine. So the, the visionary aspect, the, you know, it's very interesting, very important, and I have not been talking about that, but the medicinal aspect is so very important. The, Don Emilio used to say that you take ayahuasca to be strong in your body and to have your mind clear. I think that we have not put enough emphasis on the physical properties of, this, uh, of these uh, plants. So, another positive note, I'm finishing. Um, uh, I don't know if you know this Sebastián Salgado, it's an extraordinary photographer, Brazilian photography, who was all over the world and photographing the most horrible things you know, he was losing faith completely in humanity because we are terrible animals. And then they, he started a pro project uh, in, in the, the land of his father. They were completely devastated and planting trees. And now the water is coming back, the animals and insects are coming back, even the jaguars are coming back. So, and we are doing something similar, Aller, Aller Tamin, he's helping also with the reforestation project. I think that we have to be aware where we are. We are living in a magical planet. We are living with all these millions of species. We have to be responsible and we can change the course. Uh, we are not lost. We can do it. And the Anthropocene is all of us. So we can do it. We can change it. Thank you.
We have time. No time for questions. Huh? It's gone. Huh? You don't want to take any questions? No, I, I can't. But do we have time? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, just we've a got of some questions that have been sent in through Sligo.com. And uh, a couple questions here, Lewis. What do you think are possible ways to make psychedelics and the psychedelic experience more socially accepted? Well, one of the things that is happening is research. There are a lot of papers published on many different aspects, both from the pharmacological point of view, also from psychological point of view. Uh, works, you know, showing how, for instance, ayahuasca uh, is a tremendous medicine for depression. You know, it's proof. One of the molecules, tetrahydrohormine, is very similar to Prozac. You know, so it's a, a, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So I think that, and the information is already out there. You know, the thing is that we, you know, you have to read, read the books, read the papers, and, and we need a lot of popular, you know, people who assimilate these ideas and present it to the authorities, to the people, so they understand that, you know, absolutely there is no danger, well, there is danger there in unsupervised, you know, the set, setting, integration, very important, but, uh, and so you can take it and you, you know, uh, uh, ego inflation is one of the biggest dangers with ayahuasca. You go to Amazon, to Peru, take ayahuasca a few times, suddenly you're a shaman. You're a shaman and you are, you know, giving to other people. That's uh, the biggest uh, risk, you know. But, you know, there are no risks uh, physiologically. Uh, so I think that we need to inform ourselves and we need to inform the authorities, the medical authorities, the people, publish, you know, show that this fear of these plants, psychedelics, is the, the, the fear of nature at the end, you know. It's the fear, fear of having... Uh, opening the, the gates and understanding, because that is one of the main functions of these substances and plants, to understand our, our, that we are not separated, that we are one. Love. Yeah. <laughs> um, question specifically for you. What's the most important thing that teaching psychedelic medicine has taught you in your life? Well, there has been a teacher, you know, because I'm, I'm not in one discipline or that. I continue, my curiosity continues, and new experiences means new questions, and then I have the, the privilege of having a network of friends, you know, in so many di different disciplines. It's constant learning, you know. So I think that, you know, the curiosity is just going up, you know. Uh, normally, when you get older, you know, you, you know, you restrict your view. For me, it's the opposite completely. You know, it's just there's so many worlds in so many different fields. Another good one. How often can one use psychedelic substances without putting yourself in danger? Is once a, is once a month too much? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I took ayahuasca first time in 1971, the second time in 1979. <laughs> but all those years. I was doing my field work. I was doing you know, my homework, you know. So I think that it's not that, you know, take it many times. Integration is the very important. So it's not the question of taking it again and again. And you can, you can get addicted, not the substance, it's not addi addicted to the ritual, addicted to doing the same thing, you know. I think that it's very important that one take the juice out of the experiences as much as possible. What do you think? What, what are the consequences of commercialization of the psychedelic movement? About ayahuasca or the... Well, I mean, we live in a world in which um, economic, economic is, is basic. Um, in order to uh, produce ayahuasca, you have to grow them, you have to harvest, you have, there's work to be done, which should be, of course, paid. And the shamans, usually when I was there, they will not ask you money, but of course you have to bring something. You know, there has to be some kind of exchange. Now, when this is done just like a machine to make money, then you are losing the, you are losing the, the, the you know, the, the essence, really. And, and then you just make ayahuasca just one more commodity, and you are projecting that kind of, the kind of attitude. So uh, I, I will warn people, you know, uh, 
you know, to refrain and, uh, and uh, think, be more responsible. I think that we are dealing with sacred substances. How do you think psychedelic research can contribute to acceptance and regulation of psychedelics in our I society? I uh, answer that, you know. Of course, there is, there is, and the research is out there, you know. So, by the way, for instance, now, uh, if what Ede Fresca is proposing that the harming, you know, pro, uh, induces a, a stem cell pro proliferation, I mean, this is amazing. This is a panacea. So, so this is extraordinary. How can you <laughs> prohibit something which is medicine, which is doing good for you? Okay, harming, uh, and these are not uh, scheduled, uh, scheduled substances, but DMT, even DMT, extremely medicinal, important in, 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 in the immune uh, functions and in the stress conditions, and they can be applied. EDA is doing all sorts of applications of uh, possible applications of DNT. So, I mean, once the ev evidence is there, we just need the data, you know? Once the data is there, I mean, I don't know if the people are going to change their mind. Of course, most people have an idea, this is bad, like the missionaries, you know, the devil, they contact the devil. The same attitude continues today, you know? This is dangerous, this is drugs, this is bad, you know? I mean, simply, Get the facts, study, and then make a judgment after you know. Excellent. Okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. All right. We're going to take a, a short break. We'll be back in a small period of time. <laughs>